good morning. Welcome everyone to our SEPS Forward Innovation Academy Future of Health session today. This is our final session of the year and we're really excited to be partnering with the American Academy of Physical and Rehabilitation Medicine um, as they share work from their paper published this year, Telehealth in the PMNR, Past, Present and Future in Clinical Practice and Opportunities for Translational Research. My name is Laura Fritchie. I'm a project administrator At the digital, on the digital health team at the American Medical Association for a quick second here. For our agenda today, um, we'll have Dr. Todd Rowland kick things off, and then we'll move into kind of with all the different contributors of the paper and Q&A. There might not be, but I welcome you to put questions in the Q&A, and we can surface those to AAPM and R afterwards. And then we'll do a quick wrap up and close. Here's a quick snapshot of the contributors to the report. And from here, I'll pass it to Dr. Todd Rowland, Chair of the Telehealth Innovation Workgroup to kick us off. Great, thank you, Laura. This, and I really appreciate the collaboration with the AMA. Um, I really wanna acknowledge everybody who's uh, gonna be presenting today. You can see we've got a full crew of eight folks and uh, they'll be going into depth on their sections of our Academy's white paper. Um, we'll also be showing uh, a, a shot of the white paper that acknowledges all the full authors, and I really wanna thank them. It's been a collaborative effort to kind of put this peer review effort together. So let's, I'm gonna to move to the next slide here. And um, you know, we're gonna be talking about the telehealth efforts by the American Academy of Physical Medicine Rehab. I'm the chair of that innovation working group. Very excited to be here with our group. Um, wanted to take a little bit of time to orient everyone to what physical medicine rehab is. Um, we're also known as physiatrists, and we're, we're physicians, medical doctors who've completed training in PMNR, and we're board certified. And our, our focus includes neuromuscular, uh, neurologic disease, as well as musculoskeletal that affects multiple areas of the body, brain, spinal cord, et cetera. Um, so we've been around since the 1940s, and it really makes sense to kind of integrate things like telemedicine, telehealth into our specialty. Um, the Academy convened this telehealth innovation working group in earnest in February 2021, following the rapid increased use of telehealth nearly by everyone in the medical community uh, during the pandemic. And this working group has been charged with analyzing both innovative and transformative opportunities for our specialty and to support the long-term use and integration of telemedicine into our specialty, which is part of what we're doing today. We're doing this outreach and education and uh, talking about how it's, what kind of work we're doing in our specialty. I'm um, gonna go over some survey responses that we uh, collaborate with with the AMA. And uh, you can see that the majority of physicians in our specialty that responded to this are actively using telemedicine. Um, the most common um, activity that they're doing in telemedicine was follow-up care, such as post-surgical care, chronic care, post-hospitalization care. And then, you know, within their plans going forward, they're, they're mostly focused on medical management, chronic disease management. Um, and then they see uh, the things, the reasons to do this with patients are really to reduce patient barriers to access. So we really want to improve access to care for a lot of our patients that have functional problems, and then reduce, reduce the unnecessary costs like uh, travel, time off of work, et cetera. Uh, the barriers, has, as they've been in the past, continue to be uh, coverage, payment, reimbursement, uncertainty. So that, that's really the top of our list, and I think we share that with all medical specialties. So we're looking forward to continue to work on that. Um, and then the, we continue to have this digital divide as the biggest barrier for virtual care for our patients, where, where there's limited access to technology, either computer, smartphone, and limited digital literacy. Certainly has gotten better over the decades, but there's ongoing issues with uh, folks, particularly uh, patients who are over 80 in terms of the ability to participate. So many of the opportunities and gaps that are reported in the survey continue to be closely monitored by our academy, so it's pretty consistent. And then we've worked to address those in the white paper, which we'll talk about in more detail. So at this point, our academy continues to encourage our members to utilize and integrate telehealth into their practice. And then we're continuing to advance advocacy strategies 
for both payment parity, um, continued coverage, waiver expansions, and increased access to services, as well as interstate licensure. So the things that we'll be doing going forward are focusing on remote physiologic monitoring and therapeutic monitoring, wearables, the integration of AI. And we're using a format of a technology summit in the future to do this activity. At this point, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Adam Tenaforte, who's our co-chair of the Telehealth White Paper, and I'm gonna hand that off to him. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rowland. Um, so I'm gonna go into a little bit more on the work that we did to generate a white paper. And conceptually, what we wanted to understand is what is the current science to support the use of telehealth across the specialty of physical medicine and rehabilitation. And while we did cover topics that are unique to physical medicine and rehabilitation, often uh, these are individuals with chronic medical diseases that will receive treatment by our colleagues. So we're hopeful that this information will be uh, helpful for this greater audience. I also want to acknowledge that Dr. Uh, Joshua Alexander was the co-chair on this telehealth white paper. Uh, unfortunately, was unable to join us today, but we value his contributions. In addition, um, I, I, I want to uh, state a few things about this paper. One is that this represented the efforts not just of individuals that are joining this webinar, but a number of others uh, that are not presenting today that are all listed on our white paper. We want to note that this is published in the journal Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, which is our uh, Academy's official journal, and that this was uh, made available open access. The objectives of this white paper were for us to understand where is there evidence for the use of telehealth in our specialty, understand where, where we uh, identify knowledge deficits and limitations in the technology, as this could be helpful then for understanding future directions for research and innovative uh, strategies of translational research. In looking at the evidence, we also wanted to provide a framework for determining the strength of our findings from a focused literature review in key domains. And again, the idea is that we want this to inform current and future patient care as well as translational research and ultimately goals to ensure that telehealth continues to be used responsibly into the future. So our methodology uh, for developing our, our expert group was identifying physiatrists, so those in physical medicine rehabilitation practice that had both uh, inpatient and outpatient experiences looking at uh, different domains of care within our specialty. We conducted uh, a focused literature review led by these content experts uh, early in 2022 with um, a refresh on, on that review uh, later in August 2022 to ensure that there were no additional key references, given that telehealth is rapidly evolving, that should be added to this white paper. And what we wanted to do was, was perform this targeted search using PubMed uh, and perform additional cross-referencing of key articles. These were presented at virtual meetings, which led us then to be able to have uh, a robust discussion and generate the key findings that we outlined in our white paper and that the authors then were able to, to sign off on. So in determining the strength of the findings in each domain, we use SORT criteria. So for those that aren't familiar, SORT is, is, uh, is an abbreviation for strength of recommendation taxonomy. Uh, this has been published as being a, a strategy to rate the level of evidence. So those, uh, those, those findings that we had that were considered uh, a sort of evidence, a level of evidence A meant that there were consistent and good quality research studies to support uh, statements in a given domain. B in, included recommendations that had more inconsistent or limited quality evidence. A sort C in, includes uh, recommendations based on disease-oriented studies, practice, opinion, or consensus, which reflects 
you know, some of the key domains in telehealth uh, of lack of, of strong evidence within uh, some of the diseases that have been understudied. And then we also recognized a, a role for unrated uh, recommendations. So um, concepts that might have some preliminary evidence, but not strong enough research to uh, provide uh, a, a sort A through C. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Uh, Anna Swamy, who's gonna present on telerehabilitation. We encourage those that are, um, that, are, that are listening in to generate any questions in the team chat as uh, Dr. Roland and I will, will serve as uh, moderators at the conclusion of these presentations to, to facilitate further discussion. Thank you, Dr. Tenforti. Um, my pleasure to talk to you about the section on telerehabilitation. Preceding this section, there were sections in the white paper on physical examination through telehealth as well as diagnostic assessment. I would urge the audience to take some time to review those sections for some valuable information uh, uh, appropriate to uh, physical examination as well. Uh, oftentimes in PM&R, after we um, complete our assessment and establish a diagnosis, whether that is done via telehealth or in person, uh, one of our go-to treatment options often includes rehabilitation. Um, and um, our review of the evidence um, of rehabilitation delivered via telehealth is what is discussed in the next few slides. Uh, it is generally referred to as traditional therapy delivered virtually, either through a video and audio interface, uh, uh, such as this computer screen that you are listening to me through, or uh, sometimes integrated with other virtual care options such as um, through a virtual reality device, uh, immersive or non-immersive, or a combination of an integrated system with audio, video, and other uh, instruments or bio-peripheral devices that might be able to uh, in, uh, get input from your movement or your body uh, related to certain therapy and, and feed that back to the end user, the patient, or the virtual therapist or rehabilitation professional that is uh, supervising that care. Um, and sometimes those kinds of treatments are gamified. And uh, that kind of uh, gamified uh, therapy is often called extra games or serious games. So tele-rehab that I discuss in this section includes all of those different variations of delivering therapy virtually by physical occupational speech therapists or other rehabilitation professionals, including PM&R doctors. Most of the studies uh, that have the highest level of evidence of delivering virtual tele-rehab have been in the diagnostic categories of knee pain, osteoarthritis, as well as stroke. So in those two domains of musculoskeletal medicine and neurological medicine uh, has the highest level of evidence. Uh, Post-total knee arthroplasty uh, therapy delivered virtually through tele-rehab, uh, the outcomes uh, were found to be similar and in some instances better than in personal therapy. Uh, most of these were related to outcomes, not necessarily value or cost, but just plain outcomes. Uh, and the evidence was better probably because there's more volume of care for post-knee replacement than hip replacement. Um, Similar outcomes uh, were noted for stroke, like I alluded to earlier, primarily for motor rehabilitation, for gait or movement of the arm or return of function uh, to the arm um, compared to in-person therapy or rehab delivered in person. But there's also uh, similar outcomes or better outcomes in tele-rehab for language and cognitive rehab, uh, uh, either delivered by uh, speech therapist or occupational therapist or a combination of rehabilitation professionals. Uh, compared to stroke in neurological rehabilitation, other diagnoses like multiple sclerosis, brain injury, et cetera, there were fewer studies and the studies tended to be more heterogeneous. As a result of these uh, articles that were reviewed in this section, 
the SORT uh, diagnosis or ratings were rated as A for knee osteoarthritis and stroke uh, as telerehabilitation providing equivalent or better or equivalent functional outcomes to traditional in-person rehabilitation. And for the other diagnoses, they were rated as sort C because of lower level of evidence and more heterogeneous studies and smaller trials uh, compared to for telerehabilitation compared to traditional in-person rehab. Future directions because of uh, review of these articles uh, revealed that we needed to validate um, uh, this kind of care, tele-rehabilitation, in more specific individual rehabilitation diagnoses, such as those listed here. There's also an opportunity and potential to personalize the rehabilitation plan instead of using a very standard therapy prescription or a menu option to choose from. Instead, you can start with a baseline where meet the patient where they are at and personalize the rehabilitation to them such as would be done in, in person. There is also an opportunity to improve outcomes and settings such as home, where a patient would be encouraged to continue their rehabilitation once they're discharged from a supervised rehabilitation program uh, and left to their own. Uh, there's an opportunity to uh, improve outcomes in those settings where outcomes have traditionally plateaued. So these are future directions for research that could improve outcomes in tele-rehabilitation. Uh, it's my pleasure to transition over to the next section. Thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexis Icarino, and I am a physiatrist uh, with specialty in neurorehabilitation. We're talking about um, our assessment of the evidence for telehealth in concussion. By way of background, um, concussion is the mildest form of traumatic brain injury, and traumatic brain injury is a condition uh, for which physiatrists are trained and uh, well-established to manage and treat. Uh, for mild TBI, it really combines neurorehabilitation, which is an area of physiatry with sports medicine, which is uh, another area within physiatry. Um, when we talk about the management and treatment of concussion, overall, um, one of perhaps the, the common uh, themes related to good outcomes is that patients have access to providers and physicians that have subspecialty training in the management of concussion. And so, therefore, uh, so sorry, I think maybe the slides are moving here. Um, and maybe someone can help me get back. But, but, um, but the take home message really is that access to a provider with specialty training and concussion is one of the things that really moves the needle on outcomes in this field. And as Dr. Rollins said early in the presentation, telehealth is a means for providing that access to specialty care. I'm just gonna back up here. So um, there are no um, randomized trials that have compared telehealth to other methods, uh, such as in-person care in this area, which really limits our ability to have substantial conclusions about the use of telehealth and concussion. However, the evidence does support that it's feasible to do telehealth as much of care is provided um, with clinical interview, um, uses uh, self-assessment tools, and involves education in return to activity. And um, satisfaction in using telehealth in the management of concussion can really vary. And I'll just add that much of the data provided in the literature really comes from our colleagues at the VA who have used telehealth in theater for mild neurotrauma. Um, so there was, a, using the SORT rating system, there was SORT B evidence to suggest that concussion or mild TBI may be managed with similar outcomes using telehealth compared to in-person visits when looking at the neurobehavioral aspects of, um, of concussion um, symptomology. 
Um, and I think that's very uh, sensible as um, much of the neurobehavioral aspects would be amenable to discussion um, and uh, talk uh, via telehealth interfaces. Um, unfortunately, there's really insufficient studies um, that could provide us uh, with uh, evidence to support um, how telehealth might influence prognosis. Although again, we know that prognosis is influenced by being able to access specialty care and telehealth allows for that access. Future directions will really need to focus on comparing telehealth outcomes to in-person outcomes. Um, and that might be achieved um, through uh, clinical practices where a portion of patients do telehealth and another portion of patients do in-person care, although many patients often have a hybrid path uh, where they're not exclusively using one method or another. Certainly the ability to follow symptoms and provide guidance on return to learning, return to work, or return to physical activity um, would be tracked um, and again would be amenable to telehealth. Um, lastly, there is really a lack of consistent outcome measures used in any of even the small telehealth studies um, in this topic area. And so coming up with a set of outcome measures um, that would be consistent across studies would help us to advance um, our knowledge of telehealth's impact in concussion care. So thank you very much. I'm gonna turn it over uh, to uh, colleagues in spine and pain disorders. I think you're muted. Ian. Good morning. Yep. Can you hear us? Yep. Good morning. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'd like to thank the leadership go. of the paper as well as uh, AAPM and R for their support in this project. Um, especially over the last couple of years, telehealth has been an incredibly useful and added tool that we have to our skill set in terms of treating and providing for our patients. Uh, my name is Gene Techmeister. I'm a spine and sports physiatrist uh, at USC in Los Angeles, um, and I practice uh, interventional spine pain and sports medicine and musculoskeletal subspecialty. Um, which has a pretty robust uh, population with it, APM and R. Uh, in regards to spine uh, interventions and uh, what we're able to do, um, quite a bit of it um, can be done via telehealth. Um, initial evaluations, triaging, uh, may be particularly effective for patients that have already done some basic interventions. Um, if, we look at back pain in particular, we know that it is one of the most pervasive disabilities and impairments out there. It is the number one cost for disability in the world. It is the number two reason for seeing a physician in the United States after the common cold. But we also know that 80% improve within about four weeks. And if we're talking about the other 20%, by the time they end up in the specialist office, more times than not, they usually already have had some kind of care whether it's chiropractic, physical therapy, acupuncture, maybe some exercises. Depending on the state you're in, physical therapy can be open access, such as that in California. So patients can go directly to see a physical therapist up to six sessions. And if the pain persists for more than four weeks, it is likely that they will need some kind of advanced intervention. And that's where telehealth, I think, has a significant advantage. Now, if we're talking about rural areas where it's traveling a long distance to find a specialist or an urban area where the distance may be short, but the time may be long, I think it's an effective tool that can be used in order to optimize patient care. It's particularly effective in patients that are ha or have been seen by other practitioners, by other physicians, in terms of uh, initial evaluation when advanced imaging is available. When we take care of spine patients, obviously we look for things like red flags in order to look for sinister pathology. But if a lot of that has already been performed and now we're looking to formulate a treatment plan that's more specific, more unique to the patient, I think the utility of telehealth cannot be understated. In regards to what we have found was that not only can it address barriers to care, but adoption of telehealth services that's really spurred on by the pandemic um, can really be used to decrease economic burden because of travel. It could be used to reduce the missed appointments time if 
other social factors are involved and remote services can certainly triage patients in order to identify the more prevalent and the more serious pathologies they need optimize care more quickly and more efficiently. And at the end of the day, there can be significant cost savings when it comes to spine care, which is quite expensive, not only because of disability and lost time at work, but treatments in the itself. In regards to our SORT ratings and the evidence that we found, there was actually quite a bit of uh, SORT A evidence and literature out there that shows that the formulation of an accurate treatment plan that is performed via telemedicine um, with and if advanced imaging is available is pretty consistent across parameters both for in-person and telehealth visits meaning that if you see a patient physically in your office you can likely and will likely come up with a similar treatment plan if you see them on telemedicine and if you really look at the evidence of physical exam findings for spine conditions and pain conditions, the specificity and sensitivity of some of the ones that we think and we use most often is not as robust as we might have hoped or we may have been taught. And as such, physical exam is really not that much of a component of formulating a treatment plan for the intervention of the spine. And if there is an advanced image and sinister pathology has been eliminated as a cause of the symptoms and we're really looking at a true musculoskeletal issue or mechanical or, or somehow related telehealth offers a viable and effective medium now in terms of pre and pro prior procedural assessment the sort of recommendations are grade b which means that we don't have as a robust body of evidence but it's certainly favorable in terms of formulating that treatment plan carrying it out and following up patients now, in terms of more complex par problem solving and diagnoses of those spine conditions, that's a little bit more limited, but it's really largely due to the paucity of the available studies. Now, taking into consideration what we did find in the literature, the way uh, that our institution and some of my colleagues around the country practices, we have a pretty large referral source from the community, from primary care physicians or from spine surgeons, physical therapists, where that patient has had had significant amount of pain for an ongoing period of time is looking for more advanced care. They've already had a physical exam. They've likely already had some kind of conservative care and they're looking for an intervention. Within the advanced imaging study, the evidence shows us that we can formulate an evidence-based approach and valid plan via telemedicine. Well, that just saved one visit in person for the patient. We carry out that plan obviously has to be in person when you're talking about spine and pain interventions. But the follow-up can also be done via telehealth. And in a place such as LA, and this is really anecdotal to our practice here in Los Angeles, but you've just saved two commutes for a patient by being able to evaluate them via telehealth, carrying out the intervention that is designed and formulated via telehealth and creating a follow-up via telemedicine. And that's a not insignificant amount of time and money and traffic that can be saved. And we know that that is reasonable based on the evidence that we have collected and have analyzed. So where do we go from here in terms of spine and care? It's uh, really determining the appropriateness that this is indeed a, base, a best evidence-based practice. Um, we need to track more outcome measures and look at if telehealth and in-person can adequately create the same type of treatment of the high quality that we expect from myself and my colleagues in order to utmost treat the patients to our best abilities. Um, and from here on, we'll continue with cancer rehabilitation and I thank you for your time. Hi everyone, um, I'm Phil Chang. I'm a physiatrist at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles and I had the opportunity to author the uh, cancer rehabilitation section. Uh, so just a little background, uh, you know, what is uh, cancer rehabilitation? Pretty new subspecialty, and this is kind of one of the um, definitions that's out there for us. Um, but uh, really, we're kind of focused on the rehabilitation, um, to kind of simplify here, just the rehabilitation, uh, sorry, um, of the, uh, basically everything that my colleagues do, except our patients also have cancer. Um, so. Um, this is important um, because we can see 
um, that uh, the trend kind of over the last 50 years is that uh, cancer incidence rates are increasing um, and kind of with the advent of a lot of different kinds of therapy, um, early screening, uh, next generation sequencing, immunotherapy, uh, cellular therapies like CAR-T, uh, mortality um, in cancer has been uh, decreasing quite a bit. So, you know, all this leads to an ever-growing um, number of uh, cancer survivors um, uh, in, in our population. Um, so uh, this is um, good, and it uh, really um, shows kind of the, the strides that have been made in the oncology world, but it's not at a cost, um, as 53% of adult cancer survivors report physical performance limitations. Uh, up to 49% of long-term adult cancer survivors report chronic cancer-related fatigue. Um, over 50% of breast cancer survivors report uh, cognitive complaints after chemotherapy. And uh, decreased physical performance status is one of the most common reasons patients aren't eligible for clinical trials. So this is after patients have kind of undergone uh, the routine um, kind of chemotherapy for whatever kind of cancer they have and they're looking for uh, clinical trials. If they aren't functionally active enough, um, they will not be um, a candidate uh, for that particular trial. Um, and in this population specifically, um, I think telemedicine is so meaningful because you know there's a lot of things that we as physiatrists are able to do um, to help these, this patient population. But the problem is because our subspecialty is so new and we tend to be sequestered um, in uh, really tertiary care centers um, in major urban areas. Um, we're not widely available, um, but really through telemedicine, we're able to uh, increase access to, um, you know, kind of people um, uh, all, all over that uh, would otherwise be uh, limited um, by distance. Um, and furthermore, um, especially when COVID kind of first broke out, if you kind of looked at the list of CDC conditions just on the website um, of medical conditions that you have to consider that might put one at um, <clears throat> uh, increased risk for severe illness from COVID, uh, cancer was one of the ones that was there from the beginning. Um, so it was really, really important to our patients uh, that they were able to be seen in a manner that they thought was safe, um, especially at the uh, onset of the pandemic. Um, and telemedicine has allowed us to do that. Um, so just a little bit of background in terms of you know, what we're actually able to do for these patients. I would argue that one of the most important things um, is physical uh, examination of the neuromusculoskeletal system. Um, and there have been a couple of uh, studies that have been done showing that this is um, effectively able to be done um, for, for certain issues um, uh, through telemedicine. Um, and uh, through this, you know, we're able to distinguish whether somebody's chest and shoulder pain is from post mastectomy pain uh, for their surgery from breast cancer, or maybe it's something more benign, like a pinched nerve in the neck or frozen shoulder. Um, and then once we're kind of able to identify and get to the root of whatever is causing um, their functional impairment or their area of pain, then there's a number of different interventions we can um, offer, like trigger point injections or Botox for both pain, and spasticity, nerve blocks, joint injections, bursa injections, much of which is ultrasound guided. And then we do uh, a variety of bracing kind of all over the body whether it be a foot drop for some of these chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy or a back brace for our patients with um, multiple myeloma and multiple uh, vertebral uh, compression fractures. Uh, home exercise programs are really important because in our cancer uh, patients, we know that um, there are a lot of uh, precautions that may be um, related to uh, platelet levels um, or uh, bony lesions for anybody with met metastatic bony disease. Um, of course, we uh, do prescription modalities, things like superficial hot, cold, electrical stimulation, um, providing a lot of education counseling um, in different areas, including like lymphedema, or uh, as I uh, mentioned briefly, exercise, um, and of course, pharmacological management and uh, survivorship programs. So uh, we define cancer survivorship, um, basically uh, really beginning from the onset of diagnosis um, and then kind of continuing to um, the end of treatment. Um, but uh, survivorship programs uh, can range from anything from exercise and physical activity through things like Tai Chi and yoga uh, to uh, support groups, um, as well as classes for uh, dealing with stress um, and anxiety. So uh, there and a lot of these uh, survivorship programs are effectively um, able to be offered through uh, telemedicine uh, formats. Um, so, um, you know, telemedicine, uh, as I say, just helps us to do all this further and helps us to do it. Uh, kind of outside of our um, individual practice areas. As I said, that most of us are in tertiary and quaternary care centers. Um, and we've uh, done survey studies that have shown high levels of satisfaction among both patients and providers 
who uh, participate in cancer rehabilitation uh, telemedicine visits. Um, and this is important as some of the uh, survey questions that we specifically asked is, you know, uh, if you did this visit through telemedicine versus um, in person, would it have changed like the diagnosis you made or would it have changed your treatment outcome? Um, and uh, the vast majority of encounters uh, from our cancer physiatrists um, said no, um, indicating that uh, telemedicine is um, a valid um, use for this patient population. Uh, furthermore, we found that there was C-level uh, evidence uh, that in cancer rehab, uh, patients presenting with stable problems, uh, medication prescription uh, or titration, uh, as well as education counseling can effectively be managed with telehealth and that uh, there was uh, B-level evidence that uh, cancer rehab can be advanced uh, using telehealth-based exercise interventions aimed at improving quality of life, physical function, um, and adherence to uh, uh, physical activity recommendations, um, which uh, were uh, uh, stated by the American College of Sports Medicine in, in 2019. Um, but uh, yeah, in kind of the future, um, one of the really interesting uh, areas that I think this will go uh, is in trying to uh, get patients to be more um, adherent to kind of their physical activity regimens of like 150 minutes of aerobic uh, activity per week in addition to a two to three days a week of strength training. And there's um, a lot of third-party applications now as well as um, integrative um, uh, third-party applications like within uh, um, certain electronic medical records like Epic uh, where you can actually track uh, patients, uh, um, how, like how many workouts they're doing, how many steps they're getting um, using wearable devices. Um, so I think it's a really interesting area that's um, certainly going to be uh, part of the future of our, of our specialty. All right, I'm Dr. Bob Rinaldi. I'm a pediatric physiatrist practicing at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. And I'm going to briefly review uh, pediatric rehabilitation applications in telemedicine and what's in the literature. <clears throat> so those not familiar with pediatric rehab medicine, we're a very small subspecialty within PM&R, and we serve a predominantly chronic needs population with longitudinal needs. That includes things such as cerebral palsy, traumatic brain injury, developmental delay, um, gait abnormalities, limb deficiencies, so on and so forth. So we, we cover a lot of ground. We're actually general, general physiatrists just focused in the pediatric world. Our problem as a subspecialty is there's a limited number of us. There are about 350 board-certified pediatric rehab docs right now. And we serve large underserved populations. Uh, the, the population of kids with disabilities and impairments continues to grow. Um, and they exist everywhere in the country. They're not just limited to large metropolitan areas. Uh, so we, about 350 of us, and many of us serve, serve, uh, serve very large geographic areas of coverage. For instance, I'm in Dallas, Texas. I have four docs in my practice with me uh, within my division. And we cover most of North Texas and most of West Texas. And if you've ever been to Texas, it's massive. Uh, if you were to head west from Dallas and go to Los Angeles, between Dallas and Los Angeles, you might find four pediatric physiatrists between here and LA. Um, so we're extremely limited. Uh, we cover large uh, geographic regions. And certainly the populations are there for us to serve. So <clears throat> as an academy, that has traditionally raised a question for us about workforce needs how do we meet the needs of these populations if there aren't many of us and we cover such large regions? And that, that's where interest within the academy and particularly within my uh, subcommittee in the academy, Pediatric Rehab uh, Strategic Planning Committee, is beginning to look at how can we leverage telehealth to meet the needs of our specialty? Can we increase our footprint? Can we improve our outreach to uh, patients who may not otherwise have access to our services? Um, and uh, that then begged the question of, you know, what is our space in telehealth right now? Uh, do we exist in that world in the literature anyways? What do we know about pediatric physiatry and telehealth? And that's why I, I, I began the process of looking into this as part of the white paper. Um, so my search strategy might have been a little bit different than the other folks. Uh, many people within the world of impairments and disabilities in pediatrics are not pediatric physiatrists. They're neurologists, neurodevelopmental pediatricians developmental behavioral pediatricians, general pediatricians. So the folks within pediatrics who cover kids with impairments and disabilities is pretty broad. Uh, so my goal is to identify pediatric physi physiatric specific studies um, 
my initial uh, search included terms such as childhood, pediatric, impairment, disability, rehabilitation, physiatry, et cetera. And I came up with about 298 unique articles. I then did a uh, first screening of those articles and I purposefully wanted to weed out therapeutic intervention based articles. So for instance, OT interventions for upper extremity function and cerebral palsy utilizing telemedicine models. Um, so anything that, that was therapeutic intervention based was typically coming from the therapy world. Uh, I excluded articles where telehealth was not the primary aim of the study. Um, I excluded articles that were study based on non PRM related conditions with impairments and disabilities. And that included art articles coming out of the world of cardiology, pulmonology, mental health, et cetera. Um, and then I eliminated articles that were non rehabilitation based services with chronic disabled populations. Uh, the resulting pool is 43 articles. Uh, my second screening then specifically focused in on pediatric physiatry. And within that second screening, I ended up with six articles basically that were specific for pediatric physiatry um, and specific for telehealth applications of pediatric physiatry. Out of those six articles, two were, uh, two were original research articles and four were uh, review articles. So extremely limited in what we have out in the literature right now within the world of pediatric rehab. Uh, the two original research articles were actually quite interesting. Uh, Anton Dietzen and his group in 2020 produced an article that demonstrated a higher interest for continued use post pandemic for patients who are remote or have access difficulties um, uh, than for all patients irrespective of the distance of access, um, which I, I think speaks to, you know, sort of our innate understanding of pediatric rehab needs. I have patients who travel six, seven hours to see me for a 30 minute visit, which is ridiculous. So this fit within that sensitivity of trying to provide services for them in a more efficient way. Uh, second article was by Lauren Davidson and his group out at UC Davis. Um, and they looked specifically at school-based telephysiatry um, and found that uh, those programs for children with special needs were not inferior to in-person encounters with regard to parent and provider experience and satisfaction. And the costs associated with tele telephysiatry were on average about $100 less per person uh, or per session, I should say, than in-person sessions. And that was primarily due to savings on travel reimbursement, which fits what's known about telehealth and has been known about telehealth for the past 10, 15 years. The literature has clearly shown that there are economic advantages. Uh, when you look at travel reimbursement, you look when you look at time away from work, et cetera, uh, there are strong economic advantages to it. Uh, so that fit within what we know about uh, telehealth delivery itself. Um, and then the other four, as I mentioned, were review articles uh, that basically looked uh, at telehealth applications and pediatric rehabilitation practice. With all of this, our sort rating came to a sort C uh, with the concept or understanding that pediatric rehabilitation can be delivered effectively using telehealth with outcomes similar to in-person visits. So where does that leave us? <clears throat> well. It leaves me with the impression that we have extreme limitations in pediatric physiatry based original research studies and publications in telemedicine. Um, we, need, we need better knowledge base. Um, and when you look at potential gaps that we need to look at and address, that includes things such as cost effectiveness, economics, school days missed and saved uh, through the utilization of telehealth visits, uh, quality of care and satisfaction studies. We need more of them. Uh, we have two that looked at that, but we need more for sure novel applications uh, and models of care. Uh, there's really nothing being looked at that right now in the pediatric world, even though we think about novel applications quite frequently and we discuss these things. Uh, there's very little out there. There's actually nothing out there looking at these novel applications within the world of pediatric physiatry. Um, functional outcomes. Is telehealth affecting kids from a functional perspective? We can deliver the uh, visits, but how are these kids doing functionally? long term if they're getting telehealth intervention versus in-person visits. Um, and then expansion of services via telehealth. As I mentioned at the beginning um, of my portion of the presentation, we have extreme difficulty reaching out to populations who need us. And uh, there's nothing looking at potential expansion of services via telehealth and what, what would be the efficiency of that and what, is, uh, uh, what do we need to do to realize that. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Zolowitz. 
Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Rich Zorowitz. Uh, I'm a physiatrist who practices at uh, MedStar National Rehabilitation Network and Georgetown University uh, here in Washington, D.C. My practice is pretty much in neuro rehab, uh, which really is defined as uh, patients having uh, brain injury, spinal cord injury, and other neurologic uh, conditions. Um, we have pretty much the same issues that all of my colleagues have uh, discussed uh, previously. The thing that makes us unique, though, is that we have to deal with a lot of neurologic issues. So, for example, uh, patients with uh, brain injuries you know, may have uh, problems with mental status and speech deficits, which basically prevent our patients from giving adequate histories uh, to us. Um, they also, as in spinal cord injury, stroke, and other things, may have problems with their motor strength, uh, with apraxia, uh, muscle tone and spasticity. And basically, it may prevent patients from cooperating with a good physical examination if they're doing this by telehealth. So the result of this, and this is something that we see you know, very commonly, is that these patients need to have some assistance. So often, they're not by themselves on their telehealth visits. We usually will have a spouse or other caregiver who can help us out uh, with uh, those examinations. And so when it's appropriate, uh, these, are, these are good resources to have while doing a telehealth visit. As we did uh, the, um, the search for um, uh, telehealth uh, problems in a neurorehabilitation, uh, it was not surprising we found very, very few um, articles with it. Really, <clears throat> within PM&R, uh, the um, articles came from spinal cord injury, which really talked about different uh, categories of communication. So, for example, uh, provider to provider. Uh, one of the things that I think um, we have to deal with is that many of our patients may require many different providers whom we have to uh, coordinate care with. And so it's important that we have the opportunity to be able to talk with these uh, providers to help. Uh, there's often the uh, direct-to-consumer uh, issues that come up because there's a lot of devices and things uh, that uh, patients uh, may see out on the web and, uh, and try to purchase. And so, again, we may need to you know, get involved with that to give them appropriate uh, advice on whether these uh, devices are reasonable or not. Um, one of the things that we can use is the store and forward, which basically says that uh, by uh, taking pictures of uh, or movies of what's going on with uh, the patient, it's storing them and then sending to us, we may get a better idea of what's going on with the patient, uh, both anatomically and uh, functionally. Uh, and then similarly to, I think, what Dr. Hannaswamy talked about earlier, you know, web-based treatments uh, may be there, and interactive home monitoring studies um, are, are an important aspect of things that we may want to incorporate into our telehealth visits. And so finally, really um, what it concluded was that proposed methods can include any of the types of things that we see in telehealth, which would be you know, audio only, uh, audio visual or other platforms. Um, the um, not so surprising uh, issue here is that some of the um, studies that have come through from telehealth actually are from our neurologic um, uh, colleagues. Uh, and what they found in this article by Olszewski, which you'll see at the bottom of the slide there, is that the types of visits that are appropriate for telehealth uh, may include transitions of care, which is really one of the real uh, weak links uh, in the continuity of care. Patients going from um, acute rehab maybe to a skilled nursing facility or more likely skill, uh, uh, acute rehab uh, to home need that follow-up to make sure that they're settling down at home and getting the appropriate follow-up that they need after being in the hospital. Uh, rural care is also very, very important. Uh, and as we found in stroke, uh, you know, telehealth uh, is very good in uh, diagnosing, uh, you know, patients who have had strokes. And so same thing that we can work with these uh, people in rural areas where they as, uh, as uh, was said previously by Dr. Rinaldi, you know, if they have to come several hours uh, to a visit, this way we can help them uh, much more easily. Uh, preventive health and wellness visits are very important. Um, and then there are things like bowel and bladder, which is really one of the, I think, basic tenets of what we do in neuro rehab uh, is something that really can be discussed 
you know, over a telehealth visit very, very easily. Uh, chronic pain as well, um, as was discussed before, is one of those things that can help, as well as some of the um, neurobehavioral and uh, neuropsychiatric issues, such as anxiety and depression, um, are aspects of telehealth that we can use uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, providing good care. The nice part that we find out, and especially with patients with uh, the uh, kinds of disabilities that we deal with, um, these are people who may not have to, you know, lose time from going to work. And believe it or not, I have a lot of adult CP patients who actually work full time, uh, and it's much nicer if they can do a telehealth visit than coming in uh, for the visit. Also, it may eliminate transportation needs, especially trying to find parking, which seems to be a major issue uh, with some of the patients, um, as well as just not having to have that time to commute into the office are really nice things that if you can work out uh, with these patients uh, that work out very, very well. And what they concluded was that the more, most successful types of visits for these uh, patients um, are people with established, uh, with established needs. So basically, not first time. A lot of time, I will want to see those patients uh, and be able to examine them over. Uh, and then maybe we can go ahead and do telehealth afterwards. Patients with stable diagnoses, which most of the time um, our brain injury and spinal cord patients um, uh, will have. Uh, patients that don't require any interventions. And a lot of times, um, a lot of these patients just require some talking with to determine different types of uh, treatment regimens that we can do. And the same thing with uh, medication management. Um, so all of these things, so for example, spasticity is something that um, I do a lot of. And so when I first see a patient, we will want to see them uh, in person to try to get their, um, uh, get their evaluations done so we can figure out a treatment plan. But after we've done the first intervention, we may actually be able to do a telehealth visit and let them talk to us about how it's improved function uh, or range of motion or those kinds of things. So again, telehealth can be very, very helpful in those aspects. So in terms of the sort ratings, there's really limited evidence um, that's suggesting efficacy and acceptance of telerehab models in neurologic PMNR. In fact, I mean, we really need to look at you know, good outcomes measures uh, and good ways that maybe we can better um, assess these patients um, as we see them um, over telehealth. So that's it with my section and uh, with future directions. Um, basically, we just need to expand studies really uh, to look at outpatient management in all the areas that we look at, which is TBI, stroke, and other neurologic uh, conditions, uh, and really look at outcomes and see how uh, we can do to uh, improve quality of life uh, and function for our patients. So that concludes, um, I think, all the presentations. So I'll turn it back to Dr. Tim Forty uh, and Dr. Roland uh, for audience Q&A. Great. Well, thank you, guys. This is Dr. Roland. I appreciate this. Um, I think we have a few minutes to, to try to hit on some topics. Um, um, we've all been kind of watching the inbox of questions, and we appreciate those. There's about 10 in there. Um, there's some common themes around reimbursement. Um, that seems to be a really hot uh, area of interest. So one of the things that I'm going to just make is a general comment. I'm a chief medical officer of a mobile cardiac rehab company, and one of the things that we're finding is that even if Medicare you know, has clear criteria for billing and reimbursement, you may run into some barriers within your organization. It's often up to the interpretation of the billing teams who may not be particularly familiar with uh, various types of billing codes um, in telemedicine or CCM or other type of codes. So my suggestion for all of us is to you know, seek out partnerships with the billing administration teams and to kind of take this on as kind of an ongoing activity where we do some internal education. Um, because what we, ha we have found in working with hospital clients is that um, we're doing a lot of education of the billing teams. We're bringing in, you know, frankly, expensive consulting resources that are not even up to speed with some of what the, the current Medicare criteria are. And even when we bring in uh, 
Medicare, uh, you know, official opinions, there's there's uh, kind of some friction for that. So a lot of this has to do with some engagement between the clinical teams and I think the billing administration teams. I wish that weren't the answer, but I think that's kind of part of what's going on right now. Um, I'm going to make. I'm just going to leave that as a general comment. Does any of the other panel members want to comment on reimbursement? Yeah, so from a practical standpoint for billing and coding, many, uh, many payers are still covering these services. And the typical way that you bill is based on the level of service by time. Um, and that's primarily the time that's spent using uh, HIPAA compliant audiovisual technology, um, and and oftentimes your uh, your HIMS uh, group can help to uh, ensure that you're you're documenting this in a way that's compliant from a billing and coding standpoint. Um, I will uh, add to that by saying, most of the times the codes you you would use for tele-rehabilitation services that you as a physician would provide would be the same codes that you would use for E&M codes that you would use uh, for the uh, similar interaction in person with modifiers for telehealth. Um, and most of those are uh, platforms available through your EMR. If you are wor working in um, a large healthcare system, you might have uh, very little choice to pick and choose from uh, EMR platforms that do telehealth. Uh, one is provided to you. Um, but there are many virtual care vendors, uh, tele-rehabilitation um, companies that have developed their own platform, especially if it's integrated with technology such as virtual reality or with gaming, um, where it is not just a traditional visit performed via computer or audio video, it has other enhanced features to it. Those might incorporate other uh, platforms. And then lastly, I'll say that um, if through these means you do a virtual monitoring, um, physiological monitoring, chronic care management, things that uh, various speakers before me uh, talked about, uh, they may also have uh, appropriate codes that you could use uh, to um, bill for uh, those services that you provided that way. Right, and this is Dr. Rowan, to build on what he was just saying, there, there's established RPM uh, codes for, there's four different codes for that. Again, I think you're gonna have to work with your billing people to be sure that they're actually up to speed with what those are. Um, one of the things I'm gonna make a comment about, and I just wanna make sure it's clear, all of us are very focused on high quality patient care and by no means are we suggesting that telemedicine can replace in-person care. So I think what we're talking about is really doing things that augment the in-person experience and then kind of create a blended activity you know, that really enhance our ability to connect and communicate. So I don't really want anyone to think, because there's a few questions that were concerning, you know, just going all virtual, and that's really not what we're suggesting. The other thing I'm going to, this is uh, Dr. Zorowitz, the other thing I'm going to throw in is just also be aware of state law um, because uh, I know around here, um, if you're going to do telehealth, um, you have to be licensed in the state where the patient is. So in a, um, a situation like us where we are, we have, uh, we have uh, Maryland, D.C. and Virginia, you may actually have to be licensed in all three to be able to provide telehealth visits. I would just echo that. This is um, Dr. Icarino. I would echo that. Um, I actually participated in telehealth prior to COVID as a pilot, and that was prior to these state-by-state -state restrictions, and I had better access to patients via telehealth at that time than in the post-COVID era when telehealth became much more regulated. And now the patients who are furthest away, which arguably are those who might need telehealth, 
as a part of their care most are not able to access it. And um, I also work very closely with um, psychiatry services as part of our uh, mild TBI neuro rehabilitation program. And um, for psychologists, there are interstate compacts that allow you to be licensed in one state, but provide telehealth services in many states. This exists in the South. And I think um, we think about advocacy and, and what we might want uh, for telehealth in the future. This is something that I think about a lot because um, the ability to provide that care in other states without carrying many licenses would really um, be transformative in, um, in patient care uh, for, for my practice and I imagine for the practice of many others. Laura, how are we doing on time right now? I think let's do one more question and then we can wrap up. Um, that would be great. I know there's a lot of questions in the chat. <clears throat> one comment I'll make before that last question is we will take a look at all these questions uh, with the Academy staff. And this is really super helpful for us to think about what kind of education topics we need to be addressing in future Academy sessions. Anybody in the panel want to, want to and grab one of the questions and answer it if you feel like there's something really um, something you can address. Well, Dr. Roland, I would say that one of the questions that came up is future of, of telehealth. And I think what I hope everyone takes away from, from this discussion is that there are many areas where telehealth can be used responsibly where we really need to think about as we're utilizing telehealth, thinking about capturing common data outcome measures, the time that the patients are spending with us, perhaps how that's an offset for the costs around transportation and the cost to the healthcare payers. Uh, because again, they're oftentimes working with large employers where if we can condense a two hour total encounter that would take 20 minutes face to face, but would include transportation time that would take that individual out of the office for two hours, we're really bringing value to our patients and we're improving the quality of care. So these are important things for us to think about as we document how we're using telehealth, how as, as a medical, medical societies and professions, we need to work together to communicate, to advocate. This really isn't a red state, blue state issue when you really think about some of the hardest hit populations are those that live in the most rural areas where access to care can be quite expensive, especially considering those with complex chronic medical conditions that might require greater level of transportation costs. So I think there's ways that we can advocate across the aisle to all those within, uh, within Congress and government to ensure that they understand this is not a line item to eliminate down the road, but an opportunity for us to transform healthcare in a way that's responsible and may actually reduce the overall cost of care for our patients and, and, and improve quality moving forward. Here's our email, digital.health at ama-asn.org. If you have any questions for us, thank you to <clears throat> all of the presenters for joining today. This was a great discussion. There's lots more questions in the Q&A, so we will circulate those to you all. Um, and please, for those listening, if you want to leave questions in the survey at the end, please feel free to do that. And thank you, everyone, for joining, and have a great day.